What's up guys, welcome to another breakdown. We're looking at the LEC finals. This is the previously Mad Lions, now Mad Koi, um, with a completely rebuilt roster, El Yoya being the only one that they kept, plus a slew of rookies who have made it this far, kind of going through, through the, what's the word, through the crucible. Uh, getting a couple best of five series, having a tough way to get here, but that's pretty good, and that's really promising for this team that going into the split, the analysts had ninth. They were like, oh, we're not sure if this is D tier or C tier. It's a team of rookies. We don't know what it's going to do, and here they are in the winter in the winter finals. So uh, G2, we always expect to be there. Caps is the best Western player that we've ever seen. Uh, looking at the draft, a couple things that we've pulled out. For one, they surprised them with Zach moving into the jungle, which should, shouldn't really be that big of a surprise for most people in the world. They're like, yeah, Zach's a jungler, but he's been played mostly in the mid lanes ever since the runes changed. Zach has a big synergy with the health changes. Not only is he getting better effect out of his spells, but also he has percent max health and damage, uh, and that's really good against everyone who's now have, who has more access to more health. So Zach's prominence was in solo lanes, but he hasn't been having that much success, although he's been fairly present. He does move into the jungle, and they swap it to Yasuo. Yasuo being Zach's best friend, or I should say Zach being Yasuo's best friend. Uh, very good synergy. G2 with 21 seconds left in the lock-ins swapped Akali and Twisted Fate to get favorable matchups. Uh, you don't want to have Yasuo into Twisted Fate. The plan was to go Twisted Fate in the top lane because ADTF has been performing very well, but they end up swapping that over. One thing that I'm not a huge fan of is the Summoner Spellbook from Twisted Fate. You lose a little bit of your early power that you could be using to dictate the wave states here. Uh, and you get a little bit of trickery, but Twisted Fate already has so much on his plate as far as like where you want to get these destiny procs. I'm not sure that I like the Summoner Spellbook. Vi has some very traditional synergies here. You've got AD Hard Engage Jungler to pair up with Akali and Twisted Fate. This is a very nice put together team. And you have Senna and Nautilus. Senna being the farmer here, uh, not. I'm, ne I'm just never going to be a fan of farming Senna. While the stacks are working the way that they are, she takes too much of a hit, and she's too much of a shell of her champion, and she has a miserable lane phase. Uh, you really... It's, it's mandated the type of supports that you need to play with. You need to play these beefy supports that can just stand in in front line, and there are a lot of issues that come with that. You're seeing one of them right now, which is being pushed in by the Varus Rel, allows Zach to go three camps into an invade. Now, Yike does get the smite, which is going to save him in this situation. But you can imagine if Zach actually gets that, we're talking about a game-breaking snowball happening right here. Uh, but what is Vi supposed to do? You know, they both path top to bottom. They're seeing the urgency of the Senna Varus matchup, right? But to what end, right? Varus and Rel win this by so much that Vi really just has to be here on protective duty. Zach can engage whenever. Uh, the range on the E is going to be fairly low until level 5. That's when you're going to start being able to jump over some meaningful walls. Level 4 is okay, but you still can't get everywhere that you want to. Uh, but based on the Raptor steal, taking these camps, taking the scuttle, we're going to see a level 5 Zach approaching uh, for the grubs if they decide to go for that. They may decide to just keep on camping the spot side to get Varus super far ahead. Super far ahead, even. What else do we have going on for the team? So, triple melee to pair with Senna. That's kind of the way that you have to and want to build her. Hold on, we'll take a look at this dive. Uh, Alvaro taking up the maximum using the new synergies with the unflinching and bone plating, most likely, uh, and off uh, Aftershock. I didn't see the exact runes, but almost always we see that bone plating, unflinching synergy. So if you do get locked down, you just take mitigated damage in these 2v2s. Zach should look for a repeat gank here. Uh, totally unafraid to die. Now, Super actually took the aggro first. I don't like that play necessarily. So, uh, I do believe El Yoya still has his passive, which he easily could have used right there. Uh, yeah, Mickey does not win this. He does not have enough damage. Now, Super's coming in. It looks like he's going for the minimum. No, he's going to wish he had that one back. Just taking a moment, like it's less important to get that kill than it is to just walk away from this situation, right? The wave is crashing and no one from G2 is picking it up. So it is still a massive win. You see a 1k advantage for, for the Mad Lions. Uh, and they're going to have some residual effect right here with this wave bouncing back out. You see how when you get kills in a dive, it's always worth, right? But is it the most worth? You can sometimes get better. Great play by Mickey right there. Goaded hook. 
But we're, look at all these minions that are disappearing right now. No one's getting the cannon. Nautilus doesn't even get the cannon. Then all of these uh, minions are being taken away. Now, Supa, he could just let this set. Getting the trade, it's okay. Honestly, it's the fastest way back to base uh, for what it's worth. But giving that kill back, especially after getting those, you don't necessarily want the Nautilus to be any stronger because he could show up with boots and start actually giving you a little bit of... Um, pause when you get to these situations especially when you're up an item in the rel versus nautilus situation uh nautilus can be a little bit more tanky now this is the correct answer from g2 uh it was crashed you had a stacked wave pushing out the best response is to proactively go and crash with numbers uh, so they do that and they actually push past the wave so they're actually bringing it right back this is a wonderful play by g2 this is not something that you see in uh not even many worlds caliber games right they don't do this correctly uh, you can take a bad situation and turn it into a good situation by making the right moves proactively. End up getting a lot here, but they are going to give some back. So we've got a slobber knocker right here. 6-2, 2k gold lead in, fa in favor of Mad Lions. With the gold lead, they really can opt to play however they want. Uh, Yasuo's got this winning matchup. It is a skill matchup, but a little bit easier for the Yasuo to play than the Akali. Less resources to manage. And every time that Akali goes for a Q plus an E, then you can punish the low energy bar and try to go for a bit of an extended trade that is always going to be good for you. You really want to hit that stun, obviously. You know, I say that, but you could have just kept on walking up. There's no real good path that he could take. And not getting this consolidated kill early means that you're you're dealing with the extra damage coming out. And this is this is where the execution could have been a little bit better. It looks like the team had some miscoms as far as how strong they should be coming back in this situation. But as played, they end up with what? One kill for three deaths? Is that it? Four deaths? Four deaths. So the idea is right. Execution needs to be a little bit better. Oriana is going to be massive in these games. Very hard to play as G2 for the rest of this game. The only place that you can look for strength is up in the top lane. Now, Akali does have tons of kill pressure, and you're going to see her spiking her build to uh, go in that regard. You also see Yasuo, who would be buying Berserker Greaves anyways, uh, but absolutely is going to want the modal effect of offense and defense of move speed here. Vi should be focusing everything possible here. Ooh, a little bit of a miss there by Akali. Tries to use her R as a way to buffer past the arriving blob, slamming her down, but it's just slightly too late. Would have been a neat, neat little play. Ends up getting out, so she'll be okay. Merwin trying to step up, trying to like, mmm, look at this, beautiful. Uh, all right, you, you know why you do this. Right, look at the teleport timer on Akali. They know she has no teleport. The minions are all dying to the turret. There's no real effect to go for here. And they have information on Vive. Zach's also in the top lane already. So you're very safe as a Yasuo. Perfect opportunity to get a proxy farm off and to delay the back. So now Akali is looking at missing three waves, right? The double stacked crash wave coming in, plus the one that she already missed while, while Yasuo stopped them. And now the fourth wave up here. So this is a massive rut that that the Akali's going to have to get out of. And this is supposed to be their last Bastion, right? I don't like Yike playing towards bot side, trying to bail out Senna. You're, you should really be trying to move over to the Akali here. But now she's so far down in experience uh, that we're going to have some issues in that lane as well. Love this play by El Yoya. Um, you, we saw a little Zach mechanic there too. Q into uh, auto flash. I'm not sure if the auto on Zack is considered to be an empowered spell the way that other empowered spells are as far as not being able to be canceled. Uh, I imagine that it is because it's part of a spell effect, but by going auto flash, that means that you're going to get the fastest possible attack off to get the sling, the elastic rebound. Sometimes when you're a little bit slow, you can see them get away. These guys are obviously not slow, but buying every single quarter second or even, you know, 0 0.025 of a second is going to make a difference for them. Uh, so Elioia using the elastic slingshot and into the immediate flash auto there. Very nicely done. So now the entire map belongs to them, right? They're up almost 2k.
and it's spread out all over the place, right? The only person who's even slightly behind is Rel, and Rel doesn't care. She's got her Merc Tread. She's happy to be an engager for the team. She's going to be more than tanky enough. She's going to try to out Mickey Mickey by absorbing as much pressure as possible and then allowing the team to deal massive damage. Uh, this gives us a chance to look at the team fight composition, right? What are we trying to actually accomplish with these goals? Well, it's very easy on, on Mad Lion's side. We've got Zach with Yasuo. That's going to be fantastic in and of itself. We've got Rel and Oriana with Yasuo as well. And we've got Rel and Zach being ball delivery systems. So this is a Wombo team fight. They can use Varus as engage. He's a lane dominant champion who can get a lead for himself. And then he's going to transfer transition into uh, an engager for the team, right? His R is actually going to be a source of potential engage. So basically, they are stacked everywhere, and they can create fights. They have the perfect composition to take advantage of this snowball, and they're going to start taking over 5 eighths of the map. Uh, normally, you get 4 eighths, you get your, your half of the map, but when you've got this big lead, it's important to sort of lift your lead into a quadrant and try to take the maximum in that quadrant. So you see Zach living in the southern quad right now. Yike finally does get the counter kill onto Yasuo. It's a little bit late in coming. It should have probably been the third time by now that they went after that play but they do get rewarded here's the engage wombo all right but they're a little bit tight they're actually missing this is a little bit of a of a miss here they don't have their big damage source varus dying early means that they don't have enough damage and orion is not in position alvaro alvaro kind of missed timing right perhaps thinking that Frascawi was already back in which means they're going to get a tremendous trade back this is a nightmare situation for Mad Lions, and especially when you're rookies, thinking about the psyche of a situation like this, you know, how that's going to affect you. This is G2. This is Caps. These are the legends of, of the league, and you're trying to take them out. And if you ever feel like, oh my God, I've ruined my chances by punting away my lead, that can be such a toxic effect that can have influence on the rest of the series. Now, they're far enough... Oh, into this game with enough of a lead that they should still be able to go look for their closeout. Everything should still work out for them. Uh, but we'll see how much of an effect that has on the psyche. Also, you know that G2 is going to get the confidence boost going into game two. It's like, all right, they are capable of making mistakes. They're not just like playing on another level that we don't understand. We can, they, they will make their mistakes. We are the champs. We can get them back. And with the experience of veterancy, right, you should be able to rebound. So what, what you can do in these situations, if you're feeling yourself being caught up by the moment, right? And really, it's any time that you think about the moment rather than the task at hand, that's when you have a chance to make blunders uh, in these games. If you do ca catch yourself thinking about the moment, take a moment do any of the mindfulness resources that, that are available to you, right? Deep breathing, fill the room with smoke, you know, breathe out, whatever, whatever tool you want to do. We go over plenty of them here. Hold on, we'll watch this fight. Yoya and Alvaro just standing in the middle of the fight the way that they should, front to back, really good positioning. It is 4v3, so it's going to be a tough situation no matter how you cut it, but we do have Yike coming in, so they're going to call out and bail out. Uh, they don't have teleport from Yasuo, so they can't call for this resource el yoya just doing a fantastic job kiting and this is all of the resources if they don't get these kills here broken blade really needs to reach he needs to go and he needs to try to get the maximum here because they are giving up the same amount up in the top lane yasuo is getting three ways to himself and the turret plus they already got the kill on han sama to start that off so like i was saying the the moment right every time you recall every time you go back to base Take a deep breath and just a box breath will force your body to remove or, or reduce its cortisol levels and force your brain to come back into a more relaxed state where you can then regain your clarity. Then you can choose how much you want to optimize. If you're revving the engine too hard and then you die and you feel like it's because of a mistake and you stay revved up, then it can put you in this state where the engine can just crash, right? It can, it can fail. And you don't want that. You want to hit this reset button. You want to come back up, say, all right, it's okay. I can do this. We've gotten this far. We've made this lead. We can continue playing our style and make it happen. Uh, and realistically for this game, they're, they're making the game about kills and constant pressure. There's less macro going on. But that being said, the macro is going on in the top lane where they need it most. Yasuo is going to be uh, 
tremendously big compared to a, a lot akali uh, for the rest of this game you see completed item already compared to landry's anguish just not there three and a half k el yoya just everywhere i love that he bought this bomby sender into abyssal mask by the way something that we don't see nearly often enough it is meant to synergize with the oriana you're trying to make the oriana shockwave deal as much damage so they're putting a lot of their eggs in one basket but it's also going to hit some of the execute damage for varus it's also going to help with rel and all of her bursts the only champion that doesn't really feel this is the yasuo varus doesn't really care because his q is happening long range well before the abyssal mask is coming into play so really this uh, this item is going to be perfectly synergistic for them also allows them to get into the akali twisted fate realm uh, without caring that much about the response and um and yeah we're seeing the effects right just constant pressure nice light item right inexpensive item to buy gives you a spike it gives your team a spike let's keep on playing with momentum at every single possible turn so what i want to see from mad lions here is consistent pressure now that you have this lead i want them to consistently exert pressure use tempo at all moments anytime that they're falling back into their own jungle or going back to fix a wave is going to be considered a mistake right or a miss just an opportunity to do something better now if you're g2 you want to do the opposite you want to pull them apart you want to pull them into passive play styles but it's very difficult to do that because you have zach right zach is willing and able to punish all these fights hold on they think they found their fight they decide to go for the big engage here they do get the varus for scowie's also chunked Look at the positioning here. Elio, you're just standing right in the middle of everybody. He is going to finally blob out. G2 gets another one back. And this is going to happen when you, when you are constantly exerting pressure, and we'll call it flipping coins. Even if you're weighted 70% to, to win, you are still going to have losses, right? Now, in a skill game with perfect skill expression and no chance, then yeah, you can, you can turn that 70% as close to 100% as possible. But you see this interaction right here. Nice job by Zach landing right on the spot, but this is enough to get the chain CC, everything used onto him. And they're a little bit late on the rotation here. How did, I didn't even see how Oriana took all this damage. It's just from Akali, all right. Yeah, this is the Akali versus Oriana matchup that you're generally looking for. Now, this is the conditions that G2 want a fight, right? If they can be the ones to dictate and they can say, we can get some action to lead off, then great. This is what we want. And Twisted Fate is obviously going to be phenomenal at finding that. Akali, however, it's going to be very, very tricky. It takes Akali some time and she's got a, such a unique kit that she's going to be on the sides of fights. It's not always ideal or perfect timing to get your team synergy together also we saw a perfect positioning right there of akali and vi coming in together collapsing on the same area so there were no good escape routes to get away from the twisted fate short of a flash and really what they're going to keep on doing is they're going to look for one more engage window using ultimates to try to find varus in this flash in this flash window so all the ultimates are coming back up senna's will be last i want to see g2 find one more angle to to create this fight and it looks like they're trying to spread them out i imagine they're going to try to converge now because they're in the final seconds of the varus window and the flash is coming up and it's up now so really probably not enough they decide to take the window of enemy team of mad lines being safe for the varus and protecting the varus they say we're going to turn this into side lane turrets and try to get some gold back it's not a bad choice actually It's one of those things where you have, when you're having a diverse strategy, right? And you're, and you're coming up with different options so that you become unreadable, unexploitable. Uh, you want to have 60% that you do option A, 30% option B, and 10% something wild that still works, or that specifically that is good against the answers to your A and B plan. So I don't mind this. I would consider this the B plan. It's like, okay, we could go after Varus again. We got one. Enemy team is probably going to be a heightened awareness 
to the uh, engage versus Varus, so they're probably going to be playing fairly far back until he has that cooldown. Let's just use their passivity to be aggressive in other places. I like it. A good answer to the answer. All right, is Mad Lions going to be able to collect themselves? They're up 3k. They still have enough of a lead. They still have the Wombo. Uh, Senna will outscale Varus individually, especially Varus going for this Lethality build. Senna's going to continue getting the scaling from the Souls. Uh, plus, you have just the outright damage coming out from Akali. Now, one thing that's been a hot topic recently is that Yasuo has not even had to buy crate items despite his passive, right? So basically completely wasting the passive, saying we would rather just have access to Bork, which applies on the first Q strike, the first anything strike, uh, plus the sustain, and then going into defensive itemization, something like Wit's End, right? Tenacity. Tenacity, attack speed, movement speed. Wit's End Bork has become a problem at this level where... You don't need the crit. The crit will come, the damage will come over time. And more than likely, your contribution to the team fight is the persistent knockup of following else someone's displacement with your ultimate, getting all the armor shred that goes along with it. And you just get enough damage from this. You don't need more. But they will get it eventually. Sometimes it's been fourth item, sometimes it's been third. Uh, to just get one source of crit so you just have that time to kill uh, as the tanks get into their end game but against a fairly squishy team like this uh, just giving yourself defensive itemization making sure that you're alive long enough so that you can always follow up on the zack engage is a pretty big deal all right mad's trying to turn their lead into dragon stacking I would prefer that they just force the issue on Baron right here. Like, they want a team fight. They would absolutely love to bring this. Now, they're playing very pass passively here. I don't know if they're trying to set a trap. This is a miss. This is a missed teleport from Oriana. And this, an even worse teleport from Akali. All right, G2 should not be answering it. They think that they're going in right here. This is going to be such a tr tricky situation. Maybe with everything full up front, they try to get everything on Supa, but they just spent everything. What's the rest of this fight going to look like? I would much rather that you give this one up and just take the guaranteed resources on the top side. Oriana teleporting for first should have been a an indicator for them. Yasuo is cleaning up the fight. Oh, beautiful. Oh, man, this guy's mechanics have been clean. Because now, now that you've contested, so you're down 3k and you're contesting for dragon. The prize for winning for you, because you're only ever going to slightly win, and maybe you get one carry that lives, there's no way that you're going to be able to get anything more than that. Maybe you get Dragon, but if you lose, not only are you losing this fight, but you're also losing the Baron, and you're giving Baron to the team that needs it, right? They want to force fights. They want to force you to come. Nothing is better in the entire game at forcing people to come to you than a Baron wave, because it can't be cleared, right? You can put five people together, and you can go for your Wombo combo. Taking a look at the mechanics here. This guy has not missed a tornado yet. Look at him holding his R, right? The the amount of time that he held his R, the options for when he does and doesn't use it over the course of the game, using the bush. And this is one of those issues, right? That bush never belonged to you, right? There was it, You never had it. Your team was late to this position. You decided to contest with second teleports and second presence means that you don't have access to these bushes. You are only impromptu dropping red wards as you go whereas the other team had time to set up their vision ring and really force you to come into it they're dealing with much better information and and information is the is one of those main factors that deals with how that that compounds and and predicts who's going to win fights right who has more resources who has more synergy who has more information right those are the things that are that are computing together to build the strength of your team fights and now, and now G2 has no good place. Imagine instead if Akali had just continued to push, right? And this is something that Falco talked about in the pregame interview. The opportunity for Caps to not come teleport to answer an Oriana teleport for a team fight, uh, I believe it was against BDS, and instead staying to kill the second turret. And Falco talked about that being as a, as a, um, what's intentional. The intentionality of that play he wanted to get the team to not take every fight because yes we are good at fighting and, and we want to 
continue to practice our fighting so that we can beat Eastern teams eventually. But we have to be willing and able to take the right play when it's available. And sometimes that play is just continue pushing. And Azir uh, Caps was applauded for not joining, letting the team just move back, not taking the fight, and you get the huge bounty on that inner turret. They had the same play available to themselves this time, and they opted not to do it. It's kind of bizarre. It kind of shows that under pressure situations, teams are more likely to revert to their original play style. Whatever their identity is, people are always, always going to revert to what feels comfortable in stressful situations. That can be exploited. And if I'm playing against G2, even if G2 thinks that they're the big dogs, like they might feel some pressure here losing game one. And they might say, all right, no, all right, let's go back to what works. And that's a dangerous thing when you actually pigeonhole yourself and work your way back into a corner where now you become predictable, then you can actually compound losses and turn them into something else. Because if you lose after audibling back, now it's like, well, plan A wasn't good enough. Plan B wasn't good enough. Maybe we're not good enough. And that's a very dangerous line of thinking to get caught up in. We see that Merwin has built in a Vamp Scepter here, so he's got a little bit of flexibility in his in his itemization, what he can go next. Uh, I'm surprised by the extra Vamp. He already has the Bork. He's saying that this is what I need based on the extra tenacity. I'm going to have enough uptime that I can heal, I can drain tank my way back up in the fights. All right, let's look at the, their technique for the push here. They've got no more Baron. Um, but they've already controlled the entire Western Quadrant, and they've pushed up the middle and top lane turrets all the way to the base. And this means that they get to choose their engage when they go. Twisted Fate is not showing. Now the situation is much different. You're losing permanent structural damage as opposed to Dragon 3. This right here, we're looking at Checkmate from, from Mad Lions, and Twisted Fate is trying to make the exact same call that he did against BDS, which was to not come. Uh, but the difference is... The amount of time, how much time have you given them? They're basically two turns further ahead. They've got a bigger lead than BDS had, and they're progressing all the way to the base turrets, not just to the inner turrets and top lane. So whereas you could have traded inner turret for inner turret, and you'd be happy with that, or earlier, Akali trading the top lane inner for dragon number three, you'd be okay with that. In this case, trading the inner for inhib, not worth uh, and there's not really that much they can do about it being down 10k. Uh, there's, they can only hemorrhage gold. One of the best things that they could have done is completely ignore the push. Only try to clear the wave. Don't try to engage into any fight. Try to take structural advantages in the mid and bot lanes. But by trying to posture for maybe a defense here, you end up just giving the maximum. They get two kills. And they force your, your Twisted Fate teleport now anyways, right? Can compare that to let them get the inhib. Don't even defend that turret. Force them to come all the way to your double structures, which is way more dangerous, way harder to dive. And then say, bring the fight in here. So let's see if you can deal with the pressure inside of our base. You don't have a way out through the mid lane. And you can't just stay here forever because there's two turrets hitting you, right? So you can up the pressure on them. Try to overload their mental stack. Try to get them to push even further down in where it's a little bit less comfortable, especially for rookies, and say, do you have the mental wherewithal to, to survive this? Now, coming up with a plan like that on the spot, very, very difficult. But using visualization, using theoretical practicing, uh, you can recreate those situations in your mind. And hopefully if you get some in-houses especially as well, you can rehearse that situation. You can play out a game and say, all right, we've played out this far. We've gotten 25 minutes into the game. Rather than play to win from here on out, I want to create simulations. Let's create things that might happen in the game and practice this decision tree so that we're very rehearsed on it. Instead, we end up with some fumbles. They hemorrhage more deaths. Uh, and now their only option is to try to F their way out, you know, flash their way out. Flash engage. They try to go for everything, uh, maximum damage. They just can't do it though, especially this far out the base. Again, Yike is trying to find that window and saying, hey, I have to engage. I'm running out of opportunities to do it, but you're doing it outside the turret range, which means that you're gonna deal with the full brunt of the wallet. So 
Uh, very well done by Mad. A couple slip-ups. We'll see how that does going into the rest of the series. But you can see how pumped they are. Look how they explode out of their seat in the jungle top. They're feeling super good. El Yoya, massively pumped. You know how much this means to him because he's carrying these rookies along for, for the ride here. And, and if they can beat G2, that's going to be a huge, huge confidence boost. But beware. This level of adrenaline is going to kick up. You've got some downtime, 15 minutes before the next game. You have to rewind, bring yourself back down, bring yourself back to the optimized state where you are nervous a little bit, but you are anxious to play well, but not on overdrive. Uh, and we'll see whether or not they're able to do it. There were a couple mistakes. We saw that the roller coaster ride can kind of do that to you. We'll see whether or not they end up with a big plummet for the rest of the series.